welcome or welcome back to the company of the cat. Hi! Ghost knocked you run out of the park. So today's video is about the goodest, bestest boy. If you have seen my video about astral projection and wolf dreams, you are familiar with the main idea that wolf dreams are not just skin changing and like dragon dreams give hints to the dreamers. Ghost specifically works kinda like a green seer among the wolves. He seems to have powers of his own and this is what I want to talk about today. Before Ghost though, I want to have a look at the weirwoods because I want to point out two things that we see very often when people talk about them. The first one is the silence around them. The Hartrees and the Godswoods are constantly described as silent to the point of being kind of unnerving, depending on who gives the description. It is some sort of a pattern, Weirwoods, Godswoods and Hartrees are surrounded by silence, an environment so quiet that people perceive as disturbances even the smallest sounds, like the rustling of leaves which they believe is sent by the gods. The second thing is something I have mentioned before many times, it is the fact that the trees are always linked to the moon, giving the impression of green seers watching through the moon. The door in the house of black and white is half weirwood, carved like a moon with eyes, and Arya points out how it reminds her of the heart tree at Winterfell, and how the door is watching her. Bran describes the weirwood at Nightford as if it's trying to catch the moon. The trunks of the weirwoods are described very often by various people as glowing with moonlight, and so on. Even the description of the god on earth and his palanquin from the Far East is reminiscent of the moon. It is described as a pearl traveling and watching all over his domain. The moon is always described as an eye in the novels and palanquins are made of wood, drawing the same parallels. I have videos where I talk pretty much just about this, but it's important that I mention them here too because they are going to come up in ghost passages. I think the best place to start with ghost is when they found the puppies. Halfway across the bridge, John pulled up suddenly. What is it, John? Their Lord Father asked. Can you hear it? Bran could hear the wind in the trees, the clatter of their hooves on the ironwood planks, the whimpering of his hungry pup. But John was listening to something else. There, John said. He swung his horse around and galloped back across the bridge. They watched him dismount where the dire wolf lay dead in the snow, watched him kneel. A moment later, he was riding back to them, smiling. He must have crawled away from the others, John said. Or been driven away, their father said, looking at the sixth pup. His fur was white, where the rest of the litter was grey. His eyes were as red as the blood of the ragged man who had died that morning. Bran thought it curious that this pup alone would have opened his eyes while the others were still blind. An albino, Theon Greyjoy said with wry amuse. This one will die even faster than the others. Jon Snow gave his father's word a long, chilling look. I think not, Greyjoy, he said. This one belongs to me. One of the reasons why Ghost was named Ghost is the fact that he never makes a sound. He is extremely quiet and here we see that no one heard anything and considering that Ghost, as we saw, never makes sounds, it's safe to assume that he made none, yet somehow John heard him. It is obvious he heard something very specific because it was not the rustling of leaves or a noise because Ghost was moving around. He heard a puppy, a puppy no one else heard, because it never makes a sound and because there was a lot of noise in general at the moment and went directly to it. From what I understand here, it is as if Ghost reached out and John heard him, but not because he made a sound, but because their bond worked. But it didn't work like it does most of the time, meaning the human skin changing into the animal, either because they want to or by accident because they have very strong feelings, like it happens very often with Saggy and Recon, but because Ghost went into John. Ghost was most likely anxious because they left him behind and probably panicked enough to reach out. And John, being the only one without a puppy, was probably kind of sad and at the time he wasn't even holding one to distract or occupy him, thus he felt ghost. In various moments that I will talk about in a bit, it seems like the bond works both ways. The bond John has with Ghost is even stronger than the bond Bran, who is a freaking green seer, has with Summer. Ghost is the best trained of the direwolves since he was a puppy. It seems like it was way easier for John to connect with his wolf than the rest of the kids. The other very interesting thing is the fact that the rest of the wolves were not exactly afraid of Ghost, but they immediately became more reserved the moment Ghost appeared. It is very prevalent with Nymeria mostly because we have more interactions between Arya and Jon, but it is pointed out that Nymeria was very careful around Ghost and that Ghost had grown bigger and quicker than the rest of the litter, 
even though he was the smallest as a puppy and people said would die very soon because of the albinism. And that brings us to the way Ghost looks. He is white with blood red eyes, something that is commented on all the time because Ghost's gaze is very, very similar to the one of the Weirwoods. Very distinct because his eyes are red and piercing to the point of being unsettling, especially paired with the fact that he is very quiet. Grey Wind, her son had named him, a direwolf larger than the elk hound, lean and smoke dark, with eyes like molten gold. Lady, he said, tasting the name. He had never paid much attention to the names the children had picked, but looking at her now, he knew that Sansa had chosen well. She was the smallest of the litter, the prettiest, the most gentle and trusting. She looked at him with bright golden eyes, and he wrapped her thick grey fur. Nymeria nipped eagerly at her hand as Arya untied her. She had yellow eyes. When they caught the sunlight, they gleamed like two golden coins. Summer padding easily beside them. The wolf glanced up from time to time, eyes smoldering like liquid gold. Sagido ran at his heels, spinning and snapping if the other wolves came too close. His fur had darkened until he was all black, and his eyes were green fire. Atop the stone of the ring wall, ghost hands with white fur bristling. He made no sound, but his dark red eyes spoke blood. So we have four grey wolves with golden eyes, and two that are black with green eyes, and white with red eyes, respectively. In dance, Brynden said something that sold it to me, that the direwolves are not just large wolves, but they are indeed magical. In a sense, those you call the children of the forest have eyes as golden as the sun, but once in a great while one is born amongst them with eyes as red as blood, or green as the moss on the tree in the heart of the forest. By this sign do the gods mark those they have chosen to receive the gifts. The chosen ones are not robust, and their quick years upon the earth are few, for every song must have its balance. But once inside the wood, they linger long indeed. A thousand eyes, a hundred skins, wisdom deep as the roots of ancient trees. Green seers. It is a direct parallel to the children of the forest, and all the children have some sort of power, with the green seers being even stronger. And indeed, as I said in my astral projection video, all direwolves have some sort of power. Here they come, the female said. Mira, some part of him whispered. Some wisp of the sleeping boy lost in a wolf dream. Did you know they could be so big? They will be bigger still before they are grown, the young male said, watching them with eyes large, green and unafraid. The black one is full of fear and rage, but the grey one is strong, stronger than he knows. Can you feel him, sister? Any man grey wind mislikes is a man I do not want close to you. Those wolves are more than wolves, Rob. You must know that. I think perhaps the gods sent them to us, your father's gods, the old gods of the north. Jojen can feel something about them, and indeed the wolves seem to be way too smart and very, very good judges of character, even when people around them do not realize it. Of all the wolves, only two do not have golden eyes, Saggy Dog and Ghost. And funnily enough, these two affect their humans the most. In Saggy Dog's case, we do not know what is going on exactly, because we do not have Recon's POV, but we can see that Recon is projecting his feelings onto Saggy and vice versa making them both very aggressive and difficult to control. Rikon needs you. He's only three. He doesn't understand what's happening. He thinks everyone has deserted him, so he follows me around all day, clutching my leg and crying. I don't know what to do with him. His baby brother had been wild as a winter storm since he learned Rob was riding off to war, weeping and angry by turns. Rikon at that point was a three, four-year-old kid, and out of nowhere, everyone left. He doesn't understand exactly what is going on because it is a very difficult situation for a four-year-old to process. Even Jojen sensed that the black one was full of fear and rage. Shaggy Dog has exactly the same emotions as Rikon. And that brings us to a very peculiar scene where Bran found Rikon in the crypts. When Rikon learned that Rob was going to march south to rescue Ned, he was very upset and went to hide in the crypts. When they went to find him there, Rikon slashed at Rob's men with a rusty sword and Saggy Dog wouldn't gauge and Mikken. And after that, he was even more distressed because Saggy was changed in the kennel, refusing to even say goodbye to Rob. In the next chapter, Bran talks about the dream about Eddard in the crypt. So Osha and Maester Lewin bring him to the crypt so he can see that his father's tomb is empty. There they find Rikon, along with Saggy Dog, whom he had freed from the kennel, and he tells them that he had also dreamed that Eddard would be coming home to the crypts, and later a raven came with the news of Ned's execution. I dreamed about the crow again last night, the one with the three eyes. He flew into my bedchamber and told me to come with him, so I did. We went down to the crypts, father was there and we talked, he was sad. 
Bran had a vision from the crow, it is clear. He brought him down into the crypts to meet with his dad, and at the end of the same chapter we find out that Ned died. This is why they saw him in the crypts. Recon, for some reason, also had the same dream. And this is why a lot of people, myself included to be honest, thought that the crow was visiting other people beside Bran. But rereading stuff again for this video, I think this isn't the case. Instead, I think that Recon has similar dreams slash visions as John has when he has wolf dreams. Because when we see John's wolf dreams, it is obvious they are not normal ones, like Arya's and Bran's. The fact that Ghost is vastly different from the rest of the Darewolves is very easy to spot in the dream John had when he was out with Corin in class. Before the dream, I want to say that all the parts you see on screen are screenshots from the ebooks, so wherever you see tilted font, it is because George Martin chose for it to be tilted. When he closed his eyes, he dreamed of direwolves. There were five of them, when there should have been six, and they were scattered each other apart from the others. He felt a deep ache of emptiness, a sense of incompleteness. The forest was vast and cold, and they were so small, so lost. His brothers were out there somewhere, and his sister, but he had lost their scent. He sat on his hands and lifted his head to the darkening sky, and his cry echoed through the forest, a long, lonely, mournful sound. As it died away, he pricked up his ears, listening for an answer, but the only sound was the sigh of blowing snow. John? The call came from behind him, softer than a whisper, but strong too. Can a shout be silent? He turned his head, searching for his brother, for a glimpse of a lean grey shape moving beneath the trees, but there was nothing, only a weirwood. It seemed to sprout from solid rock, its pale roots twisting up from a myriad of fissures and hairline cracks. The tree was slender compared to other weirwoods he had seen, no more than a sapling, yet it was growing as he watched, its limbs thickening as they reached for the sky. Where he circled the smooth white trunk until he came to the face, red eyes looked at him, fierce eyes they were, yet glad to see him. The weirwood had his brother's face. Had his brother always had three eyes? Not always came the silent shout, not before the crow. He sniffed at the bark, smelled wolf, tree and boy. But behind that, there were other scents, the rich brown smell of warm earth, and the hard grey smell of stone, and something else. Something terrible. Death, he knew. He was smelling death. He cringed back, his hair bristling and bared his fangs. Don't be afraid. I like it in the dark. No one can see you, but you can see them. But first you have to open your eyes. See? Like this and the tree reached down and touched him. And suddenly he was back in the mountains, his paws sank deep in a drift of snow, as he stood upon the edge of a great precipice. Before him the skirling pass opened into an airy emptiness, and the long V-shaped valley lay spread beneath him like a quilt, a wash in all the colors of autumn afternoon. After this instance, the dream continues with watching the wildlings, and this part of the dream looks like a normal wolf dream, similar to the ones Bran and Arya have. On the other hand, the beginning of this dream is an obvious vision. Ghost did not reappear as they set out again. If the dream was true, even the thought scared him. Could the eagle have hurt Ghost or knocked him off the precipice? And what about the weirwood with his brother's face that smelled of death and darkness? This part of the dream is exactly what is going on in Brand 3 from A Dance with Dragons. He is informed about the fact that the crow visited Bran and opened his third eye. He is watching a young weirwood in a grove with Bran's face on top of various roots, which is exactly how Bran is situated and connected to the weirwood in the cave, and is repeating what Bloodraven told him about the darkness. This voice, I am fairly sure, is Bran, and the silent sound as a phrase fits the weirwood and even ghost incredibly well. Both have silence and serenity around them, while at the same time have the same strong presence and can be quite disturbing. And the second thing that I find very interesting is that it seems as if Bran is talking to him from the future and that skin changing into ghost is way closer to green dreams than normal wolf dreams. Specifically here, it's like skin changing into ghost help him connect with the trees. And I think this is exactly the case. For some reason, ghost seems to work more like a weirwood than just a dire wolf. And not just that, the writer has gone the extra mile to make sure we understand that Ghost is closer to the trees than a normal direwolf. And suddenly Ghost was back, stalking softly between two weirwoods. White fur and red eyes, John realized, disquieted, like the trees. The weirwoods rose in a circle around the edges of the clearing. There were nine, all roughly of the same age and size. Each one had a face curved into it, and no two faces were alike. 
Some were smiling, some were screaming, some were shouting at him. In the deepening glow, their eyes looked black, but in daylight, they would be blood red, John knew. Eyes like ghosts. There must be a reason why George wants us to understand that ghosts' eyes are like a weirwood's eyes, and looking at the dream above, indeed looking through ghosts' eyes, is very similar to looking through a tree's eyes. Red eyes, John realized, but not like Melisandre's. He had a weirwood's eyes. Red eyes, red mouth, white fur. Blood and bone like a heart tree. He belongs to the old gods, this one. And he alone of all the direwolves was white. Six pups they had found in the late summer snows, him and Rob. Five that were grey and black and brown for the five Starks, and one white, as white as snow. This part not only seals the deal that Ghost belongs to the old gods, but it is the moment of realization for John that he needs to stay at the wall. It is his duty, even if he remains a bastard. Ghost in the story has the role of a green seer among the wolves. This is even more obvious when we see John's wolf dream in Dance John 1. The white wolf raced through a black wood, beneath a pale cliff as tall as the sky. The moon ran with him, slipping through a tangle of bare branches overhead across the starry sky. Snow, the moon murmured. The wolf made no answer, snow crunched beneath his paws. The wind sighed through the trees. Far off he could hear his packmates calling to him, like to like. They were hunting too. A wild rain lashed down upon his black brother as he tore that flesh of an enormous goat, washing the blood from his side where the goat's long horn had raked him. In another place, his little sister lifted her head to sing to the moon, and a hundred small grey cousins broke off their hand to sing with her. The hills were warmer where they were, and full of food. Many a night his sisters packed gork on the flesh of sheep and cows and horses, the prey of men, and sometimes even on the flesh of man himself. Snow, the moon called down again, cackling. The white wolf padded along the man trail beneath the icy cliff. The taste of blood was on his tongue, and his ears ringed to the song of the hundred cousins. Once they had been six, Five whimpering blind in the snow beside their dead mother, sucking cool milk from her hard dead nipples whilst he crawled off alone. Four remained, and one the white wolf could no longer sense. Snow, the moon insisted. The white wolf ran from it, racing toward the cave of night where the sun had hidden, his breath frosting in the air. On starless nights the great cliff was as black as stone, a darkness towering high above the white world. But when the moon came out, it simmered pale and icy as a frozen stream. The wolf's pelt was thick and shaggy, but when the wind blew along the ice, no fur could keep the chill out. On the other side, the wind was colder still, the wolf sensed. That was where his brother was, the grey brother who smelled of summer. Snow, an icicle trembled from a branch. The white wolf turned and bared his teeth. Snow, his fur rose bristling as the wood dissolved around him. Snow, snow, snow. He heard the beat of wings. Through the gloom a raven flew. It landed on John Snow's chest with a thumb and a scrabbling of claws. Snow, it screamed into his face. I hear you. The room was dim, his palate hard. Grey light leaked through the shutters, promising another bleak cold day. Is this how you walk, Mormont? Get your feathers out of my face. This dream is so what the fuck, it's crazy. All cool dreams are confusing to some extent, but this one becomes even weirder every time I read it. The dream begins with Ghost running while the moon is calling him. And then we realize that Ghost for some reason can skin change into Saggy Dog who is in Skagos and Nymeria in the Riverlands. Something for sure neither Summer nor Nymeria can do as far as we know. Ghost definitely can and he also has the ability to sense them and seems distressed when he cannot sense Summer. The dream continues for a little bit more with the moon being more persistent and Ghost trying to run away from it, but also with him finally sensing Summer and understanding that he is inside the cave. Then John wakes up and we realize that the moon screaming snow was actually the raven shouting snow. And Ghost was trying to run from the moon because John didn't want to wake up. Thing is, George chose the moon to play the role of the raven in the dream. He paints the image of a weirwood colored wolf, skin changing into the other direwolves while the moon is calling him. And then he changes the moon into a raven. A very peculiar raven to say the least. This was the dream for me which confirmed that one, there is some sort of astral projection at play because not only are weirwoods consistently connected to the moon, not only do we have parallels of the moon as an eye or as a face with eyes looking throughout the story, but here we see ghosts being linked to it while the moon freaking talks. If Martin wanted to show that ghost was annoyed because John was, he could have put a bird or anything else in his dream too, but no, it was the moon that you cannot hide from talking. And two, the raven is definitely being skin changed by someone or something. 
Having such a clear parallel between the moon and the raven is suspicious to say the least. Another very peculiar thing about Ghost that hints at him being more than just a normal direwolf is the fact that he seems to know stuff. He was the one to lead John to the Warhorn and the Dragonglass, and reading the passage, it's obvious that he knew something important was there before digging it out. He didn't just find them. Ghost, John breathed surprised. So you came inside after all, eh? The white wolf often hunted all night. He had not expected to see him again till daybreak. Was the hunting so bad? He asked. Here, to me, Ghost. The Darwin circled the fire, sniffing John, sniffing the wind, never still. It did not seem as if he were after me right now. When the dead came walking, Ghost knew. He woke me, warned me. Alarmed, he got to his feet. Is something out there? Ghost, do you have a scent? Dwen said he smelled cold. The Darwin flopped off, stopped, looked back. He wants me to follow. Pulling up the hood of his cloak, John walked away from the tents, away from the warmth of his fire, past the lines of saggy little garrants. One of the horses wickered nervously when Ghost padded by. John soothed him with a word and paused to stroke his muzzle. He could hear the wind whistling through cracks in the rocks as they neared the ring wall. A voice called out a challenge. John stopped into the torchlight. I need to fetch water for the Lord Commander. Go on then, the guard said. Be quick about it. Huddled beneath his black cloak, with his hood drawn up against the wind, the man never even looked to see if he had a bucket. John slipped sideways between two sharpened stakes while Ghost slid beneath them. Ghost went racing down the hill, John followed more slowly. The torch thrust out before him as he made his descent. The night was black, the slope steep, stony and uneven. A moment's inattention would be a sure way to break an ankle, or his neck. What am I doing? he asked himself as he picked his way down. The trees stood beneath him, warriors armons in bark and leaf. Deployed in their silence, ranks awaiting the command to storm the hill. Black, they seemed. It was only when his torchlight brushed against them that John glimpsed a flash of green. Faintly, he heard the sound of water flowing over rocks. Ghost vanished in the underbrush. He found Ghost lapping from the stream. Ghost, he called. To me, now. When the direwolf raised his head, his eyes glowed red and baleful, and water streamed down from his jaws like slaver. There was something fierce and terrible about him in that instant. And then he was off, bounding past John, racing through the trees. Ghost, no, stay, he shouted, but the wolf paid no heed. The lit white shape was followed by the dark, and John had only two choices, to climb the hill again, alone, or to follow. He followed angry, holding the torch out low, so he could see the rocks that threatened to trip him with every step, the thick roots that seemed to grab at his feet, the holes where a man could twist an ankle. Every few feet, he called again for Ghost, but the night wind was swirling among the trees and it drank the words. This is madness he thought as he plunged deeper into the trees. He was about to turn back when he glimpsed a flash of white of a head and to the right, back towards the hill. He jogged after it, cursing under his breath. A quarter way around the feast, he chased the wolf before he lost him again. Finally, he stopped to catch his breath amidst the scrub, thorn and tumbled rocks at the base of the hill. A soft, scrambling noise made him turn. Behind a fallen tree, he came on ghost again. The dire wolf was digging furiously, kicking up dirt. What have you found? John lowered the torch, revealing a rounded mound of soft earth. A grave? he thought, but whose? He knelt, jumped the torch into the ground beside him. The soil was loose, sandy. There were no stones, no roots. Whatever was here had been put here recently. Two feet down, his fingers touched cloth. He had been expecting a corpse, fearing a corpse. But this was something else. He pushed again the fabric and felt small hard shapes beneath, and yielding. There was no smell, no sign of grave worms. Ghost backed off and sat on his hands watching. John brushed the loose soil away to reveal a rounded battle perhaps to fit across. He jumped his finger down around the edge and worked it loose. When he pulled it free, whatever was inside shifted and clinked. Treasure, he thought, but the shapes were wrong to be coins, and the sound was wrong for metal. A length of frayed rope bound and battled together. John unsheathed his dagger and cut it, groped for the edges of the cloth and pulled. The bundle turned and its contents spilled out into the ground, glittering dark and bright. He saw a dozen knife, leaf-shaped spearheads, numerous arrowheads. John picked up a dagger blade, feather light and shiny black, hiltless. Torchlight ran across its edge, a thin orange line and spoke of razor sharpness. Dragonglass, what the maesters call obsidian. But Ghost uncovered some ancient cachet of the children of the forest buried here for thousands of years. The Feast of the First Men was an old place, only... Beneath a dragonglass was an old war horn made from an aurochs horn and banded with bronze. John shook the dirt from inside and a stream of arrowheads fell out. He let them fall and pulled off a corner of the cloth the weapons had been wrapped in, rubbing it between his fingers. Good wool, thick, a double weave, damp but not rotten. It could not have been long in the ground, and it was dark. He seized a hatful and pulled it close to the torch. Not dark, 
Black. Even before John stood and shook it out, he knew what he had. The black cloak of a sworn brother of the Night's Watch. Ghost here knows where he is going. Even John knows that Ghost wants to follow him. It is even written in a tilted font. Ghost is so fixated on making John follow him that his behavior makes John uneasy. And John is thinking, what am I doing? This is madness. Like Danny was thinking before her pyre, but was it really madness? It seems like something is pushing them to do the right thing. Here Ghost led John to the material that would help them to defeat the others and a war horn that is heavily hinted to be the actual Horn of Winter. Direwolves, or at least Ghost, know, like Quaith said to Daenerys that the dragons know what they have to do. Dragons and Direwolves, or at least Ghost, assist Danny and John like the trees assist Bran. Then she saw, her mask is made of starlight. Remember who you are, Daenerys, the stars whispered in a woman's voice. The dragons know. Do you? And that brings me to John's resurrection. John's spirit right now is into Ghost since he died and is a warg. But we saw more than once that Ghost knows shit and through Ghost, John has visions. So John is in a position where he could learn a lot of stuff. John could talk with Bran in his wolf dream. He has all the tools to learn what is going on and communicate with him. And lastly, I don't think that Ghost is gonna die to bring John back, or at least I hope not. I know the whole only death can pay for life and all that jazz, but for skin changers, it isn't exactly the same, and we know that because of Cold Hands. Cold Hands is dead, but he seems fully conscious, and I mean fully, not like Ice Whites, and certainly not like Beric. From what I understand, Cold Hands' body was reanimated, like with Whites, but because he was a skin changer, his spirit went into one of his animals and right now he put his spirit back into his body. Or at least this is what it looks like to me. His body isn't alive but his spirit is okay, even though we know that he's been long dead. John is headed towards this path. If Ghost can project his spirit into John, as he did when he first found him, and their bond is so strong that people like Varamir would comment on how strong of a work John is, and with both of them going into each other's minds so easily, when John's body is reanimated with whatever magic, ice or green like in Colhan's case, as it seems, or fiery like Beric's, he will be able to project his spirit almost intact back into his body. Only death can pay for life, but people like John are not quite dead, so I am not sure a sacrifice is necessary. But the thing is, I wouldn't be surprised if Ghost panics is sad and while having John in his body with him projects their spirits back into the dead body and this is how John is brought back. Not only would it be wholesome as fuck if best boy Ghost brought him back, but we would also have the setup for it to make sense. We know that Ghost can skin change into other wolves and reach John himself. He is strong enough to do something like this I think and throughout the novels it is over and over again pointed out how Ghost is like the Weirwoods and belongs to the old gods. And even when they found the pups, Ghost was alone, driven away like the human skin changers and wargs that people were afraid of. My boy is important. This is it pretty much. I think Ghost not only has green powers, but he is also the key to bringing John back. If you enjoyed this video, press a like, comment your thoughts and theories, and subscribe if you haven't already. The next video is gonna be about what the hell visions Euron has because of the shade, along with a character analysis. Until then, bye!